first. I want to thank you all for wearing your masks. They are required this evening. Um, but before we listen to these brilliant speakers, we also have a few more important things to cover. There are books in the back for sale and for event pickup. If you had pre-ordered them, I will be back there at the end of the event and you can get the books from me. I will also want you to be aware there is a live stream currently going down. The audience is not visible, but if you do not want to be seen, probably don't walk in front of the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> so first I want to thank John Kay as for moderating at this event this evening. He is a Donahue Professor of Arts at UMass Lowell and an external professor at Santa Fe Institute. He is the author of Sick Souls, Healthy Minds, How William James Can Save Your Life, and Hiking with Nietzsche, which is an NPR best book and a New York Times editor choice. He believes, and I quote, that philosophy should go where the interesting questions are, which I think is a perfect vibe for a moderator this evening. And then the author that we are so excited to cross the river to join us this evening is Kirin Setia. Kirin Setia works mainly in ethics, epistemology, and the philosophy of mind. He is the author of Midlife, a philosophical guide, practical knowledge, reasons without rationalism, and knowing right from wrong, whose other bountiful writings have appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, the London Review of Books, and the Yale Review, which, you know, just a couple of places to list <laughs> this evening. But today we are discussing the beautifully blunt title for a book, Life is Hard. This book shows us just how important philosophy can be when applied to the inevitable struggles of life. This is, of course, not a pop influencer self-help book that tells you to, quote, live your best life by ignoring the more challenging aspects of living. Instead, it guides one through the tools we all need as humans to find peace in the 21st century. As a profound and personal book, we are fortunate to have Setia's experience both here in writing and here in person. So please join me in welcoming Kirian Setia and John Kegg. Thank you. So I'll sort of lay out very quickly the sort of logistics. Um, I'd like to say just two minutes about uh, the book and Kieran's work. Um, but then we'll have. Can you? Yeah. Ben. There we are. Sorry. Then, then we'll have 30 minutes um, of Kieran uh, sort of working through the book and giving you some thoughts about the book. And then I'll ask him a few questions and then we'll move right to Q&A because I can see that this is a self-selecting population and you folks have <laughs> lots and lots of questions. Um, if you weren't a self-selecting population, I would say this, that if you suffer, you should buy this book. <laughs> And if you have trouble with your suffering, you should buy this book. And if you know people who suffer and have trouble with their suffering, you should buy them this book. Um, Arthur Schopenhauer in the 19th century wrote, um, it's, it's unclear whether he titled this or someone else did, but a chapter entitled On the Suffering of the World. And at the end of that chapter, Schopenhauer says that we are companions in misery which doesn't seem to be a particularly bright way of understanding the human condition, but probably many true things are not bright, at least in the sense of being optimistic. But maybe that is the best that we could hope for as human beings, and that's where maybe compassion comes from, which was one of the messages that I received from Kieran's book, uh, which will stay on my bedside table in many dark nights. So with that, Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Ken said yes. Um, thank you very much, John. Uh, it's really great to be here in uh, my favorite bookstore with one of my favorite authors uh, and many of my favorite people in the audience. I, I'm here to, to talk about this book. So this is a book that delivers the breaking news that life <laughs> is hard. And uh, I was tempted to begin by saying, like, I hope you're all aware of that already. Uh, and then I thought, hold on. Um, it makes it sound like I'm hoping you're all admired in suffering right now. And I'm not. I really, I mean, really hoping you're not admired in suffering right now. And at the same time, I think it's an important aspect of the book that I genuinely do hope you recognize the difficulties of life, even if it makes you unhappy, and that 
being happy and living well are not exactly the same thing, and that we, we have to live in the world as it is, not the world as we wish it would be. Now, the, John is, uh, no, the, Jessica mentioned that the, one of my foils, the, the, the online influencers telling us to live our best lives, find our, our bliss, uh, the power of positive thinking. And uh, the book begins by talking about some of the prehistory of this idea, which goes pretty far back. So if you think about Plato in the Republic, he imagines justice through a utopian city-state, not by saying, here's how we can confront injustice in the world around us here and now. And Plato's student Aristotle, in his ethics, aims at the ideal life eudaimonia, like the life you should choose if you could choose any life at all, one free of uh, deprivation and human need. And it's a premise of the book that that approach to how to live is wrong, and that aiming for the ideal life is both unrealistic and often a source of dismay. Our task is always to live as well as we can in difficult conditions. There's always adversity, there's infirmity, loneliness, grief, injustice, the absurdity of the world. Uh, and I, my thought is that you know, if you've never experienced any of those things and you never expect to, then this book is probably not for you. Uh, on the other hand, um, yeah, so, so I want to talk today mostly about one of the ways in which I, I got into the fun topic of life's adversity, which was through my own experience with chronic pain. So uh, this started when I was about 27. At the time, I was living in Pittsburgh, and we were, we had gone to see a, a movie at the Oaks Theater. It's an old art cinema. I don't actually remember which movie it was. I think it was probably one of the Matrix sequels. So I was already suffering a little bit. But um, uh, then I felt a kind of stabbing pain in the side. And I thought, oh, OK. And I went to the bathroom, and I peed. And then you know, I felt kind of uncomfortable. And then I went to bed that night. And I woke up maybe 1 or 2 AM. And uh, the pain was still there. So I, I went and peed again. And as if in a, a kind of bad dream, the sensation just was totally unresponsive to what I was doing. So I spent that night sort of in a, in a day sprawled on the bathroom floor, peeing occasionally, and trying to kind of snooze the, the somatic alarm. Uh, initially, I wasn't that worried. So I went to my primary care doctor who said, oh, you probably have a UTI, gave me some antibiotics. Uh, but the test for that came back negative. So. Uh, they had to do some more fun tests. So one was this urodynamic study where I was catheterized and I they had to pee into a tube and they measure rate and flow and function. Um, uh, you know, if you feel like it's you know it's hard to pee when there's someone in the urinal next to you. Anyway, it was uh, I succeeded uh, and everything was completely normal. I went to to see a urologist. So this was this was apparently teenage urologist who performed a cystoscopy <laughs> using this old-fashioned cystoscope. It was like a telescopic radio antenna down the urethra. And uh, I have to say, it definitely felt like something was wrong. But um, he, there was no, there was nothing. There was no visible lesion or infection anywhere. So uh, urologist number two, I, w I decided this was not the guy for me. I went to <laughs> urologist number two who prescribed um, this drug Neurontin, which is a, an anti-convulsant nerve pain medication. In low doses, it's used for, for um, uh, pain that seems to be coming from nerve dysfunction, which is supposed to help with sleep. Uh, I, I think it might have been a placebo. Anyway, I stopped taking it a few years later, and it didn't seem to make any difference. And that was sort of that for about 13 years. I would sort of have flare-ups periodically. It would be impossible to sleep. Um, and then, you know, uh, 2014, uh, I moved to Brookline uh, and to MIT. And I don't want to say MIT is to blame, but um, <laughs> shortly after that, uh, the symptoms did become quite considerably worse. And so uh, I went to urologist number three. Now, she was very gung-ho. So urologist number three repeated the studies, uh, the urodynamics, the cystoscopy. It wasn't as bad this time. And uh, she, she said, there's a lot of inflammation. Why don't I just chop it all out? And I thought, well, that inflammation's bad. It seems like a plan. So she was going to do this transurethral surgery, and I thought, good, we have, we have uh, action. And then I thought, you know, I might want to get a second opinion about this whole <laughs> chopping out parts of my penis thing. So I went, um, I went to urologist number four. Now, urologist number four said, I'm very glad you came to me. Uh, that was a terrible idea. There could be very serious complications. I have a plan. The plan is, next time you have a flare-up, take these antibiotics. That, that might help. 
so about six months later, uh, I had really the worst flare up ever. I mean, like not sleeping for several days at a time. Um, and so I took the antibiotics, uh, and they didn't help at all. And I thought, uh, I think I need a new urologist. So I went, uh, I went to urologist number five. Now, you'll be happy to know that urologist number five is the last urologist in the story. Uh, I still see urologist number five. And he uh, gave me a diagnosis, which was chronic pelvic pain, which, uh, you know, it is what it sounds like and explains very little. Uh, and part of what I really liked about him was that he was very frank about the fact that it's a name for a symptom, it's not a well understood condition, there is no reliable treatment. Okay, so that was my predicament. Where could I turn? Uh, you know, some people suggested acupuncture, hypnosis, pelvic floor therapy. I thought, no, philosophy. So uh, I, I did the obvious thing. I thought, I asked myself, what have the great philosophers had to say about inexplicable pelvic pain. <laughs> and it turns out it's less than you would have hoped. Less than you would have hoped. They, they, they do occasionally observe that pain is bad, uh, but that doesn't seem to get us very far. And uh, I, I thought maybe we could get a little deeper. And I think philosophy can actually say much more about why pain is bad, and some of it uh, might be helpful. So. This is part of what happens in the book, is that the sort of approach to philosophy is as much about attending to adversity and trying to describe it as it is about trying to sort of argue around it. Um, so here's an experience you may have had. Uh, you, you're dealing with something difficult like a, a, a breakup or a difficulty at work or a health scare that's freaked you out, and you go to a friend and you share it with them, and they immediately go into assurance advice mode. They're like, it's all going to be fine, here's what you do. And it's not comforting. And it's not comforting because in circumstances like this, uh, assurance and advice can operate as a form of denial, like a refusal to just acknowledge and sit with what you're going through. And I think what we need first, at least, in our affliction is acknowledgement. And you know, often acknowledging and describing what's going on is the better part of figuring out how to cope with it. That's very much the sort of theme of the book. So, let me tell you about my attempts to, to philosophize pain. Um, they used, they, they're sort of in broadly in the tradition of phenomenology, which is the kind of philosophical approach that analyzes the, the kind of character of lived experience. And here I confronted, and I hope these are not going to fall down, the, the conventional wisdom that it's very hard to be articulate about pain. So I'm going to read you some quotes. So I think, I'm not sure this is true, but it may be that Virginia Woolf, in her essay on illness, uh, invented what's now the commonplace that it's hard to be articulate about pain. Here's what she wrote. English, which can express the thoughts of Hamlet and the tragedy of Lear, has no words for the shiver and the headache. And that idea that there's a sort of inarticulacy, a blankness to pain, is developed in a book by Elaine Scarry, cultural critic, called The Body and Pain, which is kind of a classic on this topic. So here's a, a little bit of Elaine Scarry saying, physical pain unlike any other state of consciousness, has no referential content. It is not of or for anything. Now, as someone who lives with pain, I think that Wolf and Scary are, are wrong, and I'm not alone in this. So uh, Hilary Mantel of uh, uh, Rest in Peace wrote a wonderful essay in the London Review of Books uh, complaining about Virginia Woolf. And here's what, <laughs> this, here's what, Virgin, uh, what Hilary Mantel had to say then what of the whole vocabulary of singing aches, of spasms, of strictures and cramps, the gouging pain, the drilling pain, the pricking and pinching, the throbbing, burning, stinging, smarting, flaying, all good words, all old words. No one's pain is so special that the devil's dictionary of anguish has not anticipated it. So, pulsing, burning, contracting, all good words for me. So, this idea that there's a sort of content to pain, that it's representing your body in a certain distinctive way, has been developed by philosophers. So there's a classic article by a philosopher, George Pitcher, in 1970, in which he, he, he um, argues for this idea. So, final quote, to be aware of a pain is to perceive, in particular to feel, by means of the stimulation of one's pain receptors and nerves, a part of one's body that is in a damaged, bruised, irritated, or pathological state. So I think Pitcher is really onto something there. I think he makes it sound as though 
there always is some pathology, there always is some damage. And I think one of the lessons of deceptive pain, including some chronic pain conditions, is that there may not be. Uh, you know, more extreme examples would be, you know, someone with an amputated limb who still feels pain in a part of the body they no longer have. I think the right way to put it is that the pain sort of represents your body as damaged or dysfunctional in a distinctive way, and it may or may not be. Now, that, that fact that this sort of deceptive pain gives rise to a, a kind of curious kind of reflexivity, and this is the sort of thing philosophers love. So philosophers in the audience, this bit is for you. Others, you, you, you know, take it or leave it. But uh, uh, so the point here is that deceptive pain is in a way the most meta of pains. So it, it misrepresents part of the body as damaged uh, when it isn't. And what that means is the part of the, the body that's meant to track damage, the system of pain receptors, is itself in some way damaged or dysfunctional. It's itself gone wrong. So it's telling you that there's some damage in your body when there actually isn't. Uh, but of course, that means that there is some damage in your body, namely, your system of pain receptors is not working properly. So although it mislocates where the damage is, uh, pain is never wholly deceptive. You know, you can't be in pain without some kind of pathology. Pain doesn't make that mistake. And I think there is some insight there into why pain is bad. So I think one way in which pain is bad, that uh, it goes beyond just its intrinsic badness, is that it disrupts what the, the physician and philosopher Drew Leder calls the transparency of the body. So most of the time, when you experience things, you just sort of interact with objects through your body, and the body is almost like a transparent medium. One is barely aware of one's body when things are going well. And in fact, if you focus on what's going on with your body, often whatever you're trying to do, like the yips in athletics, you crash, you can't do it anymore. And one of the problems with, with pain is that it draws attention to part of your body, and so the, the interface that should be transparent becomes cloudy, and it, it impedes your engagement with the world. So it's not just that it's bad in itself, it's that it prevents you from engaging well with good things in the world. I think that also explains one of pain's persistent illusions. So I sometimes have this sense that like, I just, what I want more than anything is just to be pain free for a while. That would just be amazing. But I think it's an illusory thought because I think as soon as the pain recedes, and sometimes it's sort of barely noticeable, when it's barely noticeable, my whole sense of my, my whole sense of my body recedes into the background. So instead of appreciating it, it's just not even there anymore. So trying to appreciate being pain free is like turning on the light to see the dark. Like it just, you know, um, it can't be done. So, um, so that was one of the, the sort of ways of thinking about pain that I found helpful. The second uh, idea about pain that I think philosophy can really help illuminate is the way in which extended pain, chronic or just you know, acute pain that lasts for a time, isn't just a sequence of atomized sensations, the, the way in which the temporality of pain transforms its character. So um, let me read a, a little bit of the book about this. So although I'm not always in notable pain, I'm never aware of pain's onset or relief. By the time I realize it has vanished from the radar of attention, it's been quiet for a while. When the pain is unignorable, it seems like it's been there forever and will never go away. I can't project into a future free of pain. I'll never be physically at ease. In the absent body, Drew Leder, who I mentioned before, and who himself suffers from chronic pain, describes its effects on memory and anticipation. Quote, with chronic suffering, a painless past is all but forgotten. While knowing intellectually that we were once not in pain, we've lost the bodily memory of how this felt. Similarly, a painless future may be unimaginable. He's echoing here the poet Emily Dickinson writing circa 1862, and I'm now realizing as I look at this Emily Dickinson poem that it is impossible to read. So uh, it consists primarily of dashes on a, you know, in front of me, and if I, was a, you know, if I was teaching this class, I would have made a handout and you would all have it in front of you and you could make sense of it. I'm gonna do my best. Um, pain has an element of blank. It cannot recollect when it begun, or if there were a time when it was not. It has no future but itself. Its infinite contain its past, enlightened to perceive new periods of pain. So one can be trapped by pain, cut off from past and prospect of relief. I think there are two lessons there for living with pain that I find helpful. The first is 
a, a kind of commonplace thought that I think I now understand better than I used to, which is why it's important to focus on the present and not project into the future. If I could experience my pain just as a series of isolated episodes, I could diminish much of its power. So I try to, many of you will know the, the sitcom Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. She's trapped in a, some of you know, it's, she's trapped in a bunker for 15 years and she eventually escapes, but she survives with the motto, you can stand anything for 10 seconds, uh, which she repeats over and over again. And I think stand anything might be a bit much and 10 seconds might be a little bit of a short time frame. But I, I, I sort of, I, I try to adapt that to, to days, if not 10 seconds. And part of that is that, you know, you can have a really great day while in some degree of pain, uh, and it's just one day after another. So there's, apart from the, the sort of temporal projection and anxiety, it just wouldn't be nearly so bad. And the second lesson here is that there's less to what philosophers call the separateness of persons than might appear. So the idea philosophers have is that when you're concerned about other people, you can't just add up or subtract their pain. You can't just aggregate them. So if you had to choose between, say, one person in agony or lots and lots of people having mild headaches, it's better to go with the mild headaches than the one person in agony, no matter how many people there are, because the pains don't add up. They affect distinct and separate people. Now, it's often said that self-concern, sort of concern for your own pain, is different from that. But I think that's actually not my experience. My sense is that if I was experiencing just a sequence of entirely discrete and separate pains, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be nearly so bad, and I wouldn't trade it for short-lived agony. Like, uh, making up an example, if you had some kind of you know, agonizing three-hour surgery performed without anesthetic that would cure my pain, if I was just having discrete episodes, I, I don't think I would make that trade. Now, as a matter of fact, I would make that trade, and if you do know of a surgery that would do that, please <laughs> tell me about it afterwards. But I think the reasons for that have to do with the sort of temporal dimensions of chronic pain. A lot has been made in philosophy of the, the sort of unshareability of pain across people. It's something that divides us from one another. But in fact, pain is no more shareable across the passage of time. I remember my mother-in-law once asking me, don't, don't ask why, but she once said to me, um, why can one man not piss for another man? And I, and, and I said, but, you know, you can't piss for your past or future self either. And as, we, as we're able to bridge the gap between now and then and sympathize with ourselves at other times, so we're able to bridge the gap between self and other and sympathize with and be compassionate for others. I'm not saying that self-compassion and compassion for other people are the same, but I think they're less different than philosophers and others often suspect that they are. I think there's real solace here, and part of the solace in this for me is the solidarity of sort of sharing the experience, uh, which has already been meaningful to me, and in compassion's power to breach the boundaries that separate us from one another and also from ourselves. So I wanna take a moment just to say, uh, Statistically, some other people in this room are in pain right now. 20% of Americans deal with some kind of chronic pain. People out there in pain, I am with you, solidarity. Those of you who are not in pain right now, take a moment to try to, to do the impossible and just appreciate being pain-free. I mean, I said it couldn't be done, so good luck. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, so, I, actually, I want, there's a brief, I've got five more minutes. Okay, there's an anecdote I want to tell, which is about my... Um, the closest I get to an epiphany, which was at, at some point when I, I, I uh, was acknowledging that the pain wasn't going away, I remember sitting in a room somewhere, I have no recollection of anything except watching people, strangers walk by, and thinking with this sort of sense of bitter envy, you don't know how lucky you got it being pain free. And it was kind of a beat, and I thought, I have absolutely no idea what's happening with these people, any more than they have any idea what's happening with me. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, it may not be physical pain, but everyone is facing some kind of adversity. And I suppose that if I was going to make a dramatic story about how I came to write the book, uh, that would be the moment in the film where I thought, uh, I must write this book. So I'm going to end with a little overview of what happens in the rest of the book. I focused all on one chapter, uh, uh, and only part of one chapter about chronic pain, uh, and there's more in the book. But I know what you're thinking is, Kieran, we don't need to hear any more about the book. 
We're all going to buy it. We're going to buy it for everyone we know. It's, it's a done deal. What we want to know is what's happening with your health these days. Um, and there is some news to report. So uh, this is exclusive. It's not in the book. You were the first people to hear about it. Uh, while uh, I was writing the book, I did six months of pelvic floor therapy. And I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. First, first, let me tell you about the book. So the, the, the rest of the book uh, is an attempt to ask what would philosophical reflection on the good life look like if it never lost touch with the fact that life is hard. So the book begins with the frailties of the body. It takes us through love and loss to the structure of society and ends with what William James, uh, one of John's heroes, called the whole residual cosmos. So, uh, spoiler alert, if you want to know the meaning of life, the answer is in chapter six. Uh, I am not going to discuss that tonight. Please don't ask me. You have to buy the book. You can, you can ask about any other topic. So if you have questions about uh, loneliness, grief, failure, injustice, not absurdity or meaning, or, uh, uh, or hope, feel free, to, feel free to raise them in the Q&A. I, I should say not every chapter is as personal as the one about infirmity. Thank God. Um, I'm not as immersed in all the ills of life, uh, but I do say something about my experience of loneliness and grief and failure, my poor attempts to challenge the injustice of the world, and my highly ambivalent relationship with hope. <sighs> Which brings us back, I think we've got time, uh, for your hope that pelvic floor therapy uh, was going to help me. Now, pelvic floor therapy is not a dignified procedure. So pelvic floor therapy is a kind of physical therapy, and there is, it turns out, only one way to gain physical access to a man's pelvic floor. I'm not gonna talk about that. You can just imagine it yourself. Oh, actually, please do not. Stop imagining that. Stop, and I am now going to talk instead about the, the diagnostic session. So how do, they, how do they diagnose what's going on? So the first session, friendly physical therapist, she was great. She had a list of questions, so uh, I've written these down. Do you have difficulty urinating? Uh, how often do you go in a typical night? Have you ever had the feeling that your internal organs were falling out of your body through your anus? <laughs> and, and when she asked me that, I, I, thought, I thought about Virginia Woolf. And I thought, this, this idea that language struggles to communicate pain? Uh, Woolf did not spend enough time with physical therapists, the masters of simile and metaphor and the creative use of language. And imagine them sitting around, just, you know, riffing, you know. Do you ever feel like your lungs are ascending through your elbows? Do you have a sense of your eyeballs exiting through your ears? You know, and every so often, some, a patient must say, oh my God, that is exactly how, I cannot believe you have put this into words. That's amazing. Um, so Kieran, did that happen to you? Uh, no. It did not. And, uh, and in fact, pelvic floor therapy really didn't help at all. It mostly what it made me do was focus on the pain and thinking about it uh, just made it worse. So, um, right. So, uh, so that's sort of the end of the talk. Now, uh, it, it's, I should say, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that that is not a great ending to a, a, a talk. Um, and that you are hoping for, for some kind of you know, revelation or, or success at the end, uh, and there isn't one. Um, but on reflection, it's really the perfect way to end a talk about this book, because despite everything, I'm doing very well. I am very grateful for my family and friends. I'm grateful to all of you for being here. Life is, is good enough. And uh, my advice, I suppose, is to forget about the dream of an ideal life and join me in making the best of a bad lot, the human condition. Uh, thank you very much. Before the, I have to, I have to set ground rules for the Q&A. If, if you have a, cu a cure for chronic pain, um, save it to, after the Q&A, you can tell me about it. If you think I, I secretly have a cure for chronic pain, I don't, 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 uh, yeah, you don't need to ask me about that. But anything else is, is fair game, okay. Actually. <laughs> So I have a few few questions, and then we'll open to the audience. And um, so one thing that struck me in your talk, which also strikes me in the book, 
is that you think very clearly, you are very funny and compassionate, and um, you write very well. And these are three independent <laughs> skills. Uh, these are separate skill sets. So perhaps could you say a little bit about um, how those different skill sets fit in the book and um, how they fit such that you think it creates a sort of compelling argument or um, maybe it's not even an argument, heaven yeah. forbid. But, yeah. <laughs> no, I have to be very careful because I have I have philosopher colleagues here who uh, yeah who may or may not want to hear this. But um, no, so I, I a huge influence on the book who I talk about a, a little bit but not as much as she deserves is the the novelist philosopher Iris Murdoch, and one of her central ideas in moral philosophy is that an enormous amount of ethical reflection really takes the form of just trying to describe your circumstance, just trying to figure out. Uh, is that person jealous? Are they frightened? Are they nervous? Are they intimidated? And just describing your circumstance accurately is an enormous amount, she thinks maybe the whole of, trying to figure out how to cope with it. And one way to think about a shift in my conception of philosophy in writing the book was to be more open to the idea that it was a, a task of philosophy to engage in that kind of thick description, not just something that Murdoch would tell us was part of ethical life, but something that um, uh, doing and exploring which would count as a form of, of moral philosophy. And uh, you know, one form that takes, I think, which is very important to the later parts of the book, and that Murdoch is also emphatic about, is sort of conceptual innovation. So she says at one point, I'm not going to get the quote right, but that one of the tasks of moral philosophers is to extend, as poets extend, the limits of language. And it makes you think of sort of, you know, cool poetic ideas, but one of the examples I illustrate it with is this idea of structural injustice, which is developed by the political theorist Iris Marion Young, which doesn't sound fancy and poetic, but is a kind of, for me, an example of how the lines between philosophical argument and just imaginative description are pretty blurry, because an enormous amount of the work that's done by talking about, say, structural injustice, the idea of justice, injustice, that is a matter of, a matter of individual people acting unjustly or having prejudicial attitudes, but emerges structurally from that interaction. An enormous amount of the work that's done is just by being able to describe that in a way that we can actually then bring into view and, and think about how to respond to. So for me, at least, that the lines between the more cru sort of writing and philosophy are blurry. I mentioned one last thing, which is that people talk about the influence of Simone Weil on Iris Murdoch. Weil uses the term reading to describe what she also calls attention. So this attention to the world around you, she describes as a kind of reading. So the idea that there's, that there's sort of deep connections between um, the sort of creative and thoughtful use of language and philosophical insight is, is sort of part of what drives the book. On this um, topic of philosophy's scope and what philosophy can speak to and what it cannot, um, at the very end of William James's life, he writes to his friend Benjamin Blood that philosophy can only do so much and there's always an ever not quite to philosophy. Um, it can't touch a certain sort of halo of experience. And I'm wondering, can you speak a little bit to the way that that realization allows us to address another person's pain, which might fill in the gaps between Wolf and Mantel, for example? That's very interesting. I mean, I, the, the thing that makes me think about it is one of the, the ways in which philosophy is bound to fall short, understood in the way I'm understanding it, is that if, it's, if the goal is to really describe what's going on with someone, then I should be writing this book about all of you. Like, I should not, you know, the, what, what's happening here is me taking myself as a case study in the hope that it's somewhat generalizable or the, the tools are generalizable. But there's a way in which it... it one of the limits of writing a book about philosophy is that there are things that you have to do yourself to think about your own life that no one else can really do for you. I suspect there's also a deeper thing there that you, you that the kind of worry or sense that there's the sort of cognitive transitions that you make when you're doing philosophy, and there's a gap between between the sort of thinking part of things and then the emotional life changes. And I think there's there's truth to that too. And I haven't quite figured out how to relate to it. I mean, there's, 
you know, there's always the possibility of, of setting up a, a, you know, a commune where we can all sit around and, and do, you know, spiritual exercises. I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to do that, but I, I take it part of the appeal of, for instance, Stoicism, which I have intellectual doubts about. Um, but part of the appeal of Stoicism and its sort of revival recently is that it really does offer you something that goes beyond the intellectual into here are some things you do every morning, here are some things you do every evening. There's a practice that goes along with it. And I haven't quite figured out what practice, sort of what the practice would be that would play that role with respect to my conception of philosophy beyond just, you know, buy lots of copies of the book and have a, have a book club in which you all sit around and talk about, does this actually fit my experience? And some of it will and some of it won't. I mean, basically, that's just a way of saying, yeah, do, do philosophy, but yeah. I'm also thinking about the sort of inaccessibility which of pain, uh, uh, which philosophers have talked a great deal about. Um, and I think that Wolf is right in a certain way. And you mentioned this when you said, when I look out into the audience, oh, yeah. I don't know who's, I don't know who's suffering and who's not, and I don't know the degree to which they are, and I never will. And yeah. there's a way in which our words fall short in a certain way to express that. Yeah. But I also think what I think's very interesting about this book, and I think the reviewer from the Times said it really nicely, is that you never say, um, feel better, everything's okay. In yeah. fact, you're talking to a friend, uh, I believe she says, that um, just continually is with you, and that somehow makes you feel better. And so I'm wondering what it is to be with somebody but not impose our conception about what our pain might be like on them, which you don't seem yeah, to do at all yeah. in this book, but seems to speak to that gap between uh, what I can understand about you and the interiority of your pain and my own not. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this connects to several things in the book that I haven't really put together before because you know one of the, the chapter about loneliness is very is sort of one of its central themes is the way in which sort of a, a kind of self-suppressed listening is sort of central to acknowledging the, the value of other people and really sort of responding to other people and I think you're right there's a kind of in, a kind of balancing act in trying to describe things in a way that's at all prescriptive between you know trying to think for someone else and the thought that ultimately I should just be be listening um, I think that's a very interesting connection and and I think a, a sort of tension in, in my my um, relationship to the the material um, I think I just need to think some more about that so I'm mindful of time I, if it's okay I'd like to open for questions and then maybe um, I'll ask you a couple more, but I think sure. that we'll have lots of questions. Go ahead. So, um, obviously you're a philosopher. Uh, so, thanks for this talk. Obviously you're a philosopher, but I wondered if you had thought about religion. Because both Buddhism and Judaism, and to a lesser extent Christianity, talk about suffering as the core experience. I mean, I, I think it, it really is, I mean, we've just gone through the whole high hol holidays for the Jew people are Jewish, and for Buddhists, it's like 101, that life is suffering, and there's a way out of it, which is to be mindful of it, basically. But I'm curious whether you wanted to interact with that, or you just figured out that philosophers do things so differently, it, you, it won't even bother. Well, no, I talk a, a bit about religion in the book. I mean, I, I'm not myself religious. I'm a sort of wannabe secular Jew. I would like to, you know, uh, uh, the epigraph to my, my last book, the midlife book, was the was Rabbi Hillel's, uh, um, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me, and, and you know, et cetera. If, if not now, when? So um, I definitely, I think some of w what happens in the chapter I, I promise not to talk about, which is about meaning and absurdity, is, uh, which, um, actually begin the book with talking about Job, but I come back to it there, is, is the question what kind of, you know, it, it, given this recognition of the, the, the difficulties of life and the ways in which they're, you know, in various ways, can be ameliorated but are not eliminable, how can we, how, sh how can we accept the universe? Like, how can we come to terms with reality and be okay with, uh, you know, life, the universe, and everything, which is, you know, that's what the, the chapter about the meaning of life is about. And, 
I do think you know, that religions often often offer a kind of saving vision, or that the at least the assurance that there is some kind of way to make sense of reality on which um, uh, it's you can come to terms with suffering while fully acknowledging and not denying it. Um, so yeah, I feel like I can't no more. I can't uh, that having. Uh, having given the spoiler earlier, I can't say any more about that. But I do, I do think there are secular accounts of how we, secular stories about how human history might go and how we might relate to it, that could play the same kind of role. I just think we, what, what I think they could never give us is the kind of assurance in advance. Um, but then I think a lot of people who are religious, who aren't even, who like non-secular Jews, for instance, uh, assurance is not the right term for their relationship to their faith. It's, it, it's, it's something much more, well, faith. Um, so, so that's the part of the book that most squarely tries to, to think about whether, in a way you could think of it, the, the book starting with physical pain and then emotional pain in connection to loneliness and lost people you lose, and then failure and your role in society and the sense of how you're being judged, and then justice and injustice. And then the, there's really a, a, the chapter is about, although I don't use the word spiritual pain, it's about a sort of the spiritual pain of looking at the world and thinking, this is not okay. Like it just, reality is not okay. Uh, is there anything to say to, to try to respond to that feeling? Um, I think, I'm afraid that's as much as I can say right now without uh, <laughs> breaking my earlier promise. Other questions? So hearing the, the anecdote about you being in the hospital room and thinking, you know, these people have, have no idea how good they have it, um, it seems like one of the things that pain, at least of many kinds, often does is impose a kind of isolation. There's a sort of self-absorption that, I mean, that's a negatively balanced way of putting it, but that sort of pain is kind of self-involved self in a way. And there's this kind of weird fact about that, which is that we all suffer. So if anything, you would think here is a sort of one of the guaranteed conduits to like connect us to other people. Um, so I was I was wondering if you had any any thoughts about the sort of why it is that this thing, which is sort of essential to the human condition, something that, that we share, um, how to grapple with the fact that it has this this isolating, self-absorbed tendency of a of a certain kind. So this this is where the sort of weirdness of the audience. Because, so there's, there are philosophers, and then there are there are people who are not philosophers, and there are people who are they may not even be professors. Like you know. <laughs> anyway, so so I, there's sort of a question of how to answer this for different audiences. What I think what I what I want to say really is just um, right. So the, the the way in which pain sort of draws you into yourself and sort of draws focus and makes it very hard to be to outward is is an obstacle. How do you how do you get over that? And for me. What, part of why I wrote the book was the thought, well, um, a, f a thing that might be good would be to just write uh, a book in which I just talk frankly about this and see what happens. And hopefully some other people will read it and think, I too have this embarrassing condition. Uh, I'm glad that that's, I can now say, uh, I'm, I'm like that guy, he's at MIT, it's got to be okay. Uh, you know, uh, that, that there's a sort of sense of, of, of solidarity that can be extended there. Also, that I, in ways that I think I cannot yet understand, feel like I really got something out of writing about it pre-communicatively. So I think the thought, well, look, I can communicate with people. That's part of the, the appeal of this. But then even before anyone read it, which is, I mean, no one's read it. So I mean, like hardly anyone's read it yet. But just the act of writing it was very transformative for me. And I don't really understand why. I'm trying to, it, it reminds me, I have two anecdotes. So one is um, when our, our kid who's here somewhere was little, I'm going to embarrass them, um, when they would get obsessed with something and perseverate, we had this tactic, which they're going to tell me didn't work. So really, I'm gonna, for the purpose of the story, it worked very well. The tactic was uh, you write down the thing that you're obsessed with on a piece of paper, you crumple it up and you throw it in the trash and you just, and I have something about that feeling about having written about it. I'm like, it's now done, it's done, like, yeah, that's over. Like, I mean, it isn't over, but there's some sense of having externalized it and put it at a, at a distance in text that in itself already feels like getting it under control. I don't quite understand, that seems, um, 
vaguely mystical, but it, that, that seems to be happening. The other anecdote was that the, uh, how much time, can I, this is a, I'll try and keep it short. The, the, one of the coolest things that's happened, so I have talked about this a little bit in a, I did an interview, um, uh, a radio interview, and I talked about chronic pain, chronic pelvic pain, and gave a little bit of the story. And I got an email from this guy um, who turns out to be one of the leading chronic pelvic pain researchers in the world. Uh, who also has chronic pelvic pain. This guy's in sex. So basically, he was a mechanical engineer, and then he became a mathematician, and then he got chronic pelvic pain, and he thought, well, I need to figure this out. So he became a neuroscientist, and now he works at USC. And the thing I love most about the story, um, and this will give you a disturbing sense of my temperament, was uh, we, we had a fun Zoom conversation, and I was like, so what's the state of that? What's going on? Like, can you figure it out? And he's like, no. <laughs> We have, we have in no way figured this out. But um, uh, even he had various suggestions of things to try that I hadn't thought of, but he was extremely unpat about the, about the, the miracle cure. Um, so that was a moment where I thought, I can't believe I'm having this conversation. And uh, he, I, I mean, I don't know if this is true, but I think the hope that he will be able to tell people in his clinic who don't want to talk about this, um, you know, uh, listen to this radio interview, someone is talking about it. I don't know, maybe that will help people. But that, I think it's a very practical response to the question, how do you get over the metaphysical privacy of blah? It's, well, talk to people about it. Um, and the same thing about loneliness too, I think loneliness itself has this sort of involuting character where it's very shameful to be lonely. And like, you're in this catch 22, but more people should just talk openly about how difficult it is to be lonely and how lonely they are. That would be a good start, however hard it is to do that. The questions. Thanks so much, Karen. So I was just wondering, I was struck by uh, too close maybe. Um, I, I was just struck by it seems like in the title and the preface there's a sort of extreme emphasis on the universality of pain, which it seems like you're focusing on a lot, and that just seems like it just seems like that's a extremely politically sort of unfashionable thing at the moment. And I was just wondering if you felt any pressure between focusing on the universality of pain as potentially obfuscating like the extreme differences between the amounts of pain that people actually face. That's a good question. I mean, there's, there's various points at which I say and mean. Um, I'm one of the advantages of taking myself as a case study is that I feel some degree of authority to talk about it, and your situation might be very different. Um, so, like, there's a discussion of, I was very nervous about the discussion of disability in the chapter on infirmity, because I don't have any particular physical disabilities, and I wanted to write about it, but I thought, you know, um, I could be not only wrong, but wrong in a way that's disrespectful. And, and so there are definitely moments where I felt that way. And, you know, it's the book is written from a certain perspective. So if you think, like, when I think about the chapter on injustice, it's not how do you deal with injustice if you are the direct victim of injustice? That will be an important topic to address, and people have written about it. But it just isn't quite my topic. So in a way, it's not universal. It's how do you, as a relatively privileged bystander to an, uh, to an enormous amount of injustice in which you're in various ways complicit or from which you're in various ways benefiting, how do you deal with it? And there I think it's clearer that it's not universal. So, you know, there's a kind of, um, you know, in what sense is suffering universal? There's this sort of, you know, expect the unexpected. It sounds like a paradox, but of course you can't, you know, you should expect the unexpected. You just don't know which particular unexpected thing. And I feel the same way. Like, Surely everyone deals with some hardship and suffering in their lives, even if it's not exactly these ones. So maybe I can have my cake and eat it too by saying suffering is universal. However, the particular sufferings I'm focusing on are, are not, although they're all ones that are relatively generalizable. I mean, you know, not everyone deals with pain or loneliness as much, but, uh, you know, to, I think to some extent mortality is behind at least a lot of the, the difficulties I talk about. So a, a lot of the stuff about grief and failure and injustice is connected with, or you know, the, the sort of pervasiveness of suffering is just connected with a feature of the human condition that I don't think is gonna change. I and mean, one thing is that uh, 
I have a I have a mean remark about the fantasists who think we're going to upload into the cloud and live forever, which I think is is uh, d demonstrably impossible. But um, uh, yeah, so I think I think we're, we're all going to die, and that that we just had that in common. Thanks, Karen. Okay, so I was really struck by what you said about sort of I don't know the ideal condition of the body being that it's transparent and the way that pain makes you aware of your body. And I was kind of wondering if you thought that that generalized at all to other kinds of ailments or um, experiences we have in life, like certain mental illnesses. I mean, an obvious example would be living with an eating disorder and the way that that might make your body less transparent to you, um, but also just sort of living like as a, as a woman or, you know, other just other experiences. And I wondered if you thought that that might be sort of a general uh, yeah. Sort of uh, bad making feature of, <laughs> of like, yeah. That's really, really interesting. I, I deliberately, so the, I think I don't have an answer other than that seems very interesting. I should think about that. Um, <laughs> the, I deliberately decided not to talk about mental illness or mental disability, psychological disability in the book because I, that was a case where it wasn't just that I felt like I didn't know it's about enough about it. It was a case where I thought I knew enough about it to know that it was far too complicated for anything I was going to manage to do in this, the scope of the book. Um, and yeah, I think I just need to think that there's, that there's a kind of idea that I'm ambivalent about, uh, a, a kind of wider idea about sort of ideology and the idea that um, problematic ideologies sort of obfuscate our relationship to social reality. So you know, the example I do talk about is the idea that uh, you can judge people as failures or successes, and that there's some kind of currency for doing this, and it probably has something to do with certain kinds of like financially indexed social standing. And I think lots of people in, understand themselves in those terms, and it's completely I mean, optional. Is not, it's not too generous a word for it. It's, it has a particular history, and it's deeply problematic, and it, we should be attempting to to sort of re-envisage that. And you think, well, okay, maybe there's a general thought here, which is that our relationships to ourselves are clouded by various kinds of misconception. At that level of generality, maybe it's too general, and maybe the idea that the sort of solution is just see reality as, as it is, is too glib. Um, so I kind of hesitate to generalize it that much, but maybe. Um, and so I think what you're pointing to are cases, the very interesting cases sort of in between um, you know, the ideology of financial measures as the as the test of your worth as a human being. There's, you know, um, you know, gender ideologies that affect how you relate to your own body and the people around you. And uh, sometimes that can be problematic, right? So, but but is is this is there a is there really an ideal of transparency in which all that goes away? I don't know whether that's a whether that really makes sense. Another question. Thanks. So this is connected to the stuff you were saying at the beginning about um, all pain being pathology. I thought it was really interesting that you uh, talked about defective pain kind of being a metapathology. But I was a little less convinced about the first order claim uh, that pain is pathology. And what came to mind for me is my own personal experience of the worst pain I've ever been in, which is having a baby. Um, and it's not like I'm going to make some argument that like being in pain is good, I, I, but more just that it's unclear to me that labor pain counts as pathology, that something has gone wrong. Of course, it can go wrong, but it isn't always the case that that kind of pain means that something has gone wrong. Yeah. And then I was thinking if I could come up with any other examples, and this isn't quite the same, but what I what came to mind is another kind of pain that I've been in, which is like after playing in a very difficult Ultimate Frisbee tournament the following day on Monday, I like can't walk, I'm in so much pain. And maybe that counts as pathology, I'm not so sure though, like my muscles are healing in a certain kind of way. Anyway, I just was curious if you had thought about these cases and what I, you would say. I think the answer is I, I retract my earlier comment. So I, <laughs> I, I, I think you're right that, 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 that the, the, this is a case where I, I think language can capture these experiences, but it's definitely a clunky instrument and I was pretty clunky. So I, I'm thinking, 
damage. There is some damage to the body often going on in childbirth, or when you're playing a sport and you like aches and pains and what bruises you'll have to recover from. Some of it's damage, but often it's you know calling it pathology or dysfunction is uh, yeah is often just inaccurate to the description. So I think the thing to say is I was not give for someone who says finding the right words to describe <laughs> things is is a key part of being being ethically responsible. That was pretty. Uh, uh, hasty of me. So yeah, I, I think I'm just open to the thought that yes, a, a better, richer vocabulary for describing these things is totally welcome. And you're right that there are, yeah, both of those seem like cases where the relationship to dysfunction is, is uh, not obvious. It seems like things are in certain ways going exactly the way they're supposed to, or they could be going exactly the way they're in some sense supposed to go. Um, yeah, I think it, that's right. Thanks, Karen, for this. Um, as you were going through your account of your, your five urologists, I was thinking of this <laughs> account that Rouse Daltat, I don't know how you say his last name, Dutat, Daltat, you know, the New York Times. Oh, yeah. So he got Lyme disease, and, you know, like oh, yeah. you, he went to five specialists, and they said this and that, and, you know. What he took from that is a kind of skepticism of expertise, and in particular medical expertise. And I'm just wondering, have you taken away from your experience any attitude towards expertise, you have a take on sort of philosophical expertise because, you know, you say these philosophers haven't accounted perhaps for the experience, but do you, have you learned anything about people who claim to be experts in society on, on pain or on anything else that you think <laughs> is a product specifically <laughs> of your experience but is transferable to other realms? That's a great question. I, I'm, since this is not in print and I can never be quoted, I can, I will, uh, I, will, I can venture some, some. Hi guys. Um, I, I can, uh, I can say some, some, uh, some more reckless things. I mean, I would say, my sense of, of the doctors that I experienced. And one of the things I love about urologist number five is that he said, uh, doctors are ashamed of uh, failing, and. Uh, so they will often deny that there's anything wrong to avoid having to admit that there's something wrong they can't fix, or they'll just come up with something uh, because it's very shameful to fail in that way. That was one thing he said. And the other thing that I think he didn't quite say, but I got thinking about the expertise is that you know, this is not an original thought, but that pain is particularly ill understood and ill treated by doctors. Doctors themselves constantly are, are sort of, this is a kind of topic of concern about the ways in which you know, partly because it's diagnostic, it's sort of instrumentalized by doctors in a way that their relationship to pain is very different from the, let's get rid of the pain. It's like, excellent, the pain will now guide us. So they have a weird relationship to pain. But, but more broadly, I think there's, there's the fact that when you're dealing with people who are suffering, there's a kind of ethical aspect to what you're doing. And, you know, I, I think, I don't know enough about how doctors are trained to know whether the kinds of training, whether the balance between technical training and human training is where it should be, but often what struck me about the doctors I didn't like, um, or who were not good, was that it seemed ethically problematic. Like they just seemed uh, in some way or other callous or um, conceited or like, it, I, I, was, I was very judgy about them on, on ethical grounds, uh, more than doubting their competences doctors. I mean, if, if, as I suspect, is true, this is just, it isn't a well understood condition and no one knows how to treat it. I don't think the fact that they were at sea is a sign that they didn't have the medical expertise. It's just they didn't know how to deal with the fact that they didn't have the medical, that, that the medical expertise, they were at the limits of it and they were in this human situation and they didn't, uh, until number five, they didn't know how to deal with that in a way that was actually going to be um, uh, honest and and thereby, for me at least, like the beginnings of like coming to terms with things. Thank you. This has been wonderful. Um, I was hearing a tension uh, when you were talking between um, the way you narrated your story about pain and the way you described the rest of the book. So I want to pull out this tension, and what I'd love to hear is whether you reconcile that tension in the book. So 
the tension is, um, you were talking about how we shouldn't be chasing some sort of ideal life with the idea that anything short of an ideal life is somehow catastrophically flawed. Um, so there's this sense of life being inherently mixed, that, um, and that that's, that's reality. But then when you were talking about pain, you were talking about the body being either in pain or not in pain, and you talked about gradations of pain. But I kept hearing the phrase pelvic pain, which names the fact that the rest of the body is not in pain. It names the mixed state of the body. So there seemed to be a tension between how you were talking about physical pain and how you were talking about life overall. So I'm wondering whether that tension exists in the book overall or whether you reconcile it. So can you say more about the, what the, the, the tension is? So I was say, say more about the, the, the tension between sort of acknowledging that the pain is, is focused and like bits of me are fine. Um, and as I was thinking that the, the general tenor of the book as a whole is one that acknowledges that uh, some some things could be going well when some other things are going badly, and that exactly. yeah. But and um, I mean, there's an, a kind of further dimension to, to this, which is, in some cases, I think, for instance, in the case of grief, I think part of the complication is not quite the way to put it. Like that, that's a case where the pain is is. Um, well, going back to the childhood pain, in fact, the, the, the pain of grief is not something that we should want to get rid of. So the, in the cases like that, it's even even more complicated to sort of untangle the relationship between living as well as you can in the circumstances and, and living pain-free, because that doesn't seem to be the right kind of ideal. But is this quite, I'm not sure this is quite getting the, no, it's the getting, attention. it's getting right at it, because that seems to be how you're talking about, about life overall. I, mean, I haven't read the book yet, yeah. obviously. Um, but with pain, there's, there are very few physical conditions that cause pain in 100% of the body. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yes. my point is that, that physical pain is normally a kind of mixed state. I see. And so what I'm wondering is whether your book um, talks about that, whether you bring that forward, that mixed state in the body as well as in life overall. I mean, I'm not sure I really talk about that in the bodily case. And I think it's, to me, it seems complicated partly by the, this thought about transparency and the recession of the body, which is that, you know, in the rest of life, you might say, there are good things and there are bad things. And the good things are positively good and you can appreciate them and you shouldn't let the bad things occlude that. And that's a very humdrum, but I think profoundly important like, point about, how, about life. In the case of pain, the, 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 non in, the not in pain parts of the body are not, um, often I think that they're, they're not positively in a good state that you could appreciate in the way you can appreciate the good things in your life. They're just working fine and therefore transparent. They just sort of recede into the background. So that might be a way in which the pain, the, the nature of the mixedness in pain is a bit different from the nature of the mixedness of the good and bad in the rest of life. But the answer is, is in, in the terms in which you just asked it, it's not really something I quite address in the book. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking about it on the fly right now. I wanna thank Kieran for this book. And I want to thank you for your time here tonight. I will say one very quick comment, that it is incredibly rare for a book to do as well as this book has done this week. And it deserves to. It's also incredibly rare for a book that has to deal with suffering and the hardship of life to do as well as it has. And I think that's a testament to what Kieran has done here and I want to thank him for that, and thank you for tonight. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. I should say that there will be a signing. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the signing line will happen up here at the front. Um, if you already have your books, you are welcome so to much. line up. I do encourage, if, like, you're further in the bag, if you want to, like, let the people at the front go first, so you can sit while you wait to sign. That is also a valid response. And yes, thank you so much for coming. It was wonderful to have everybody here, and it's always nice to see a full house. So thank you guys.